Hi everyone, um, and welcome to the seventh and final science and conservation event of our 2023 to 24 program. So thanks so much for being here tonight. My name is Liv Wilson-Holt, um, and I'm the Human Wildlife Coexistence Projects Manager at ZSL, based in our conservation and policy department. And I'm really excited to introduce this event, fostering coexistence between people and wildlife during global crises. So part of my role as ZSL, alongside my colleague Rebecca Sennett Day, who's here in the audience as well, has been to manage a ZSL-led project funded by the UK government's UK Aid Match programme, which, thanks to the generosity of donors to our four people for wildlife appeal, was set up in 2020 to support four communities in Kenya and Nepal to coexist with wildlife by building financial resilience, improving livelihood opportunities, and forging better relationships with wildlife authorities. And UK aid match projects are made possible through the generous donations by the UK public, where every one pound raised is matched by the UK government. And as well as ZSL's project, we'll also be hearing about two other UK aid match projects, which have had a focus on human wildlife coexistence, and which have all been implemented under challenging global conditions, including climate change, COVID-19, and the cost of living crises. And these projects have some really important lessons to share with you tonight that will be really useful to take forward into future project design and implementation. And we'll also be hearing from ZSL's monitoring, evaluation and learning specialist, who will be sharing her valuable insights, including from her experience undertaking impact evaluations of joint conservation and development projects. So to kick off, um, our first presentation tonight has been pre-recorded by myself, Nelly Musioka, who is a community liaison officer at ZSL Kenya, and Mahesh Basnet, who is a senior program officer at ZSL Nepal. And Nelly is a dedicated community developer who champions for community-led conservation. Through her tireless efforts, she has empowered local communities to take ownership of their natural heritage, fostering sustainable practices and harmonious coexistence with wildlife. And Nelly's vision is of a future where humans and nature thrive in symbiotic balance. Her conservation roles, rooted in empathy and pragmatism, inspire others to join her cause, ensuring a legacy of conservation for generations to come. And Mahesh is responsible for planning, implementing, monitoring and evaluating ZSL projects in Nepal. And he works to coordinate with relevant government agencies, buffer zone management committees and other partners to ensure effective collaboration. And with almost nine years of work experience in the conservation and development field, Mahesh has been involved in managing projects focused on natural resource management, climate change adaptation, child development, and livelihood development. And the title of this talk is Four People for Wildlife, Fostering Coexistence in Kenya and Nepal. Uh, good, evening, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Mahesh Pasnet. Uh, I'm from uh, Zoological Society of London. Um, and uh, today I'm joined by my colleague uh, Nelly Musioka and Liv. Uh, the title of our presentation uh, is For People, for Wildlife, Fostering Coexistence in Kenya and Nepal. Uh, today, today we are going to be talking about uh, ZSL's UK Aid Mass Fund project funded by the UK Aid government. The project was uh, titled Stewardship and Rural Development for Poor and Marginalized frontier communities living alongside protected areas and high conservation value spaces. And it was implemented between November 2020 to October 2023. Uh, in, our, uh, in our presentation, we will first discuss uh, the project context and our aim, activities and, uh, activities and objectives before highlighting some key impact statistics, challenges, and uh, lesson learned. So in Kenya, where we worked, uh, ZSL work is focused on the Savo conservation area in the southern east of the country. Here we worked in two buffer zone communities, that is Mangelete and Kamungi, which are situated within five kilometers from the boundary of both Savo East and Savo West National Parks. The people living here face high levels of human wildlife conflict, particularly from carnivores such as lions as well as elephants. Our partners on the projects were Savo Trust, Five Talents, Wildlife Works, and the Kenya Wildlife Service. Um, in Nepal, ZSL work focused in the Tara Arc landscape, uh, one of the priority areas of the government of the Nepal. 
uh, in the southern part of the country. And here we worked uh, with the people who, li who lived near to the two community forest. Uh, Namuna, Namuna community forest uh, is in the buffer zone of the Chito National Park and uh, Dutpani community forest uh, is further east uh, in Tanusa district. Uh, which is uh, set in a wildlife corridor spanning from Chitwan to Eastern Nepal. Um, and the human wildlife conflict is primarily crop uh, damage, although uh, elephants, snakes, tigers, and uh, leopards do occasionally uh, cause other issues. Uh, while working with this, we work with uh, uh, two implementing partners, Himalayan Nature and Mithila Wildlife Trust, while the uh, Department of the National Parks uh, and Wildlife Conservations oversaw the projects. So the overall goal of the project was to improve the well-being of people in four remote rural communities in Kenya and Nepal and contribute to the protection of natural resources while securing wildlife from unsustainable exploitation. And we aim to achieve this through four key activities, which reached 1,298 people overall. So firstly was improving financial security by establishing two community banks in Nepal and 10 village savings and loans associations in Kenya. Secondly was supporting community members to diversify income and adopt new sustainable livelihoods such as beekeeping, livestock or vegetable farming and shopkeeping. Thirdly, was fostering human wildlife coexistence through conflict mitigation measures such as predator-proof kraals, planting crops that animals don't eat, and increasing dialogue between project stakeholders. And then lastly, was building positive relationships between communities and park authorities by facilitating interactions opportunities. So turning to our impact, the project achieved some significant results despite challenges, which we'll talk about next. So firstly, we saw substantial declines in both the number of community members illegally using natural resources, such as firewood and fodder for livestock, as well as in their self-reported dependency on these resources compared to the beginning of the project. And we believe that this is partly due to the fact that over half of our participants began to generate an income by project end which also contributed to an increase in their wellbeing score. So the majority of participants also said that conflict with wildlife had decreased or strongly decreased in year three of the project. And this corresponded to an increase in people's perceived ability to cope with incidents when they occur. And lastly, attitudes to conservation improved significantly thanks to the project's outreach activities with almost all participants having a strongly positive or positive attitude by project end. So some of the challenges that we faced in Kenya while implementing this project are uh, the Savo area faced a severe drought from the end of 2020 to November 2023. So essentially throughout the project uh, period, uh, this excavated poverty, potentially driving an increase in wild meat hunting and consumption in the worst affected areas. It also negatively impacted the enterprises developed as part of the project, including beekeeping, where all the bees uh, left the hives in search of food. Although the scale of the drought made it difficult to overcome, the project engaged with the NGO Save the Elephants, who held training, several trainings, including on how to make alternative food for the bees using honey and icing sugar. And by the project end, this had already resulted in one group successfully dividing a colony, thereby increasing future honey production. Uh, number two, there were poor and sometimes hostile relationship between community members and the protected area authorities uh, prior to the project. Uh, the project therefore pr prioritized extensive outreach activities, including drop-in session with key uh, project stakeholders, so that community members could raise uh, grievances, provide feedback, and talk through solution. Additionally, uh, we add bus tours into the national park. Uh, this gave the community members an opportunity to view the wildlife as tourists, where previously uh, they may have only seen certain animals in the conflict setting. These activities contributed to positive results at both outcome and output level. And lastly, uh, human-elephant conflict is a major conservation issue around Savo, but we did not have the resources to be able to mitigate this under this project. We were, uh, however, 
ever able to help community members feel listened to by facilitating increased dialogue between them and the Kenya Wildlife Service on this issue by providing training on how to stay safe around wildlife. This included the establishment of seven community-led human wildlife conflict resolution committees, which provided a formal structure for community members and park management to engage on human wildlife conflict on a regular basis, such as via WhatsApp group where people can report problem, uh, problem animal sightings and helping reduce the grievances. Um, so uh, key challenges challenges in Nepal include the COVID uh, pandemic with severe restriction on movement at different periods of time, uh, leading to delays in implementation. Although we knew about this risk beforehand, um, <clears throat> Nepal also suffers from unforeseen COVID outbreaks uh, throughout the project period. We adapted uh, by rescheduling the activities as well as reallocating funds for emergency food, uh, aid and the PPE for the worst affected villages who were especially vulnerable to the knock-on effects of the COVID such as um, lack of employment. To further support these people, the community bank also decided to prioritize the low interest rate uh, loan for the community uh, bank member based on the ranking of the well-being necessity so that uh, they were able to uh, adapt, adopt new or strengthen the, their existing livelihood. Uh, secondly, uh, our project participants were heavily occupied with agricultural activities such as wheat and rice farming at different times of the year, which, which made it difficult to engage them for certain activities uh, such as longer training sessions, sometimes resulting uh, in project delays. Uh, also, uh, federal and the local election meant uh, that the project stakeholders and the participants were occupied during the campaign uh, <clears throat> with the election related activities which are uh, often at a short notice. As uh, this, wa uh, this was a three-year project, uh, it, was, uh, it was a challenge to catch up with these delays, uh, as well as those caused by the COVID restrictions. Uh, to mitigate this, we ensured that our work plans remained flexible and uh, looked far ahead, taking into consideration the availability of the different stakeholders, as well as being realistic about what we could and could not achieve within the project uh, period. Um, lastly, uh, most of our project participants are from marginalized backgrounds, uh, meaning they may not have uh, um, <clears throat> previously been involved in decision making uh, within the local community, uh, including through governance structures such as um, community forest user groups. Uh, an initial challenge was therefore to ensure that their voices were being heard uh, and considered as an equal member of the community. We tried to resolve this through regular meetings with all the members of the community, uh, including uh, including engaging with people who have traditionally held more power to stress the importance of the equitable uh, decision making. And just lastly, um, on to some key learnings. So as previously previously discussed, drought directly affected our activities um, as well as drove more severe and frequent incidents of human wildlife conflict. And alongside rising costs of living in both countries pushed people further into poverty. And this led to some internal conversations about whether or not we should or had the resources to provide humanitarian aid in the worst affected areas in Kenya. So how can we learn from this to better support climate change afflicted households in future projects? Well, we need to ensure that we're factoring in climate resiliency and adaptation into project design, such as working with new partners to trial options for drought resilient livelihoods or improving the supply and management of water in the area. And although the mitigation measures we implemented, such as post proof kraals, were 100% effective, we did not have the resources to support all our project participants, nor were we able to tackle conflict from all species. So how do we ensure that we aren't inadvertently pushing conflict to new areas? We should be aiming to implement human wildlife conflict solutions at a landscape scale rather than a local scale. And this won't happen overnight, nor without increased funding and investment, but by taking a holistic approach to human wildlife conflict management, we are more likely to be implementing sustainable solutions for people and wildlife. 
And lastly, before the project started, there were non-existent or sometimes hostile relations between community members and protected area authorities. And as discussed earlier, improving these relationships was a key focus, both to gain community acceptance of the project, as well as for the sustainability of our activities. But how can we ensure that these new positive relations persist once the project has ended? Our experience has been to build trust slowly over time through regular engagement to ensure that communities feel listened to and for stakeholders to be held accountable for their actions. And formalising this engagement is also beneficial. And in Nepal, this is already the case with community forest governance structures. But in Kenya, where no such structure exists, we found that human wildlife conflict resolution committees provided that crucial platform for community members to discuss human wildlife conflict related issues with both KWS and other stakeholders working in the landscape with the aim to ensure these conversations continue post project. Thank you so much for listening to our talk. We hope you found it interesting and looking forward to any question you may have. Thank you. Great, hope you all enjoyed that. Um, our second presentation now is from Dan Bucknell, who's Chief Operating Officer at Tusk Trust, and Richard Granville, who is Program Funding Manager at Ripple Effect, formerly known as Sendacal. And Dan began working in conservation in Cameroon, first at the Limbu Wildlife Center in 2000, and then as a research assistant for the Cross River Gorilla Research Program in 2022, sorry, 2002. From 2002 to 2009, he worked for the Guerrilla Organization, initially as grants manager, and then as regional program manager. And then from 2009 to 2014, he was head of conservation and campaigns at Elephant Family, from where he joined Tusk 10 years ago. And Richard leads a team of three institutional fundraisers, overseeing proposal development and contract management for a growing portfolio of donors, including Jersey Overseas Aid, the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office and the Isle of Man government, working closely with colleagues in Africa. And he's worked at Ripple Effect for eight years and before that in a range of fundraising roles across the charity sector. And the title of their talk is Living with Wildlife, Refle uh, Reflections on a Livelihoods Conservation Partnership. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation to, uh, to present. Um, my name is Richard Granville. Um, I work for Ripple Effect. Um, you might know us by our old name, which was Send a Cow. Um, good name for a charity, memorable, bad name for an international development charity. Um, that's not what we do. Um, we work primarily on livelihoods. We work with smallholder farmers um, in East Africa. Um, and uh, yes, working to increase their nutrition so they can better feed their families um, and that they can get a sustainable income from their farms. Um, um. Uh, yes, thank you, Richard, and uh, thank you, Liv, for the introduction. So, yeah, I'm Dan Bucknell from Tusk. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with Tusk, um, we uh, amplify the impact of African-driven uh, conservation organisations across Africa. So we invest in partner organisations um, doing grassroots conservation act activities on the ground um, and help um, enhance their capacity and enhance their impact um, throughout the continent and helping to protect all species from turtles um, off the coast of Kenya to chimps in Guinea. So this is, the, uh, this is our project called Living with Wildlife. Um, the map in the centre there shows Uganda. Um, the blob, darker green blob up in the northwestern corner is Murchison Falls National Park. That's where the project was located. Um, the slightly more detailed map uh, shows the park itself. Uh, it is on the Nile River. Um, it's the, both the oldest and the largest national park within Uganda. Um, it has, I think, four of the big five species. Um, unfortunately, also has a very long history of um, human wildlife crime. Um, and there's quite a high population density, um, particularly, again, in the northwestern corner. Um, and this is really where our, uh, our partnership uh, came about. Um, Ripple Effect, as I said, is primarily interested in or was in the livelihoods of those farmers. And we realized that actually there was a connection there 
um, between the farmers not actually being able to uh, to generate that sustainable income um, to to grow the food they needed from their farms um, and and the cycle of, of wildlife crime. Um, it followed at the agricultural patterns. When agricultural patterns were low, there's a, um, a three-month window in the from June to August where productivity is at its lowest. Um, on the farm, that was also the peak in the wildlife crime. So we realized that by potentially doing a project which looked to remove some of those drivers to increase income, um, to improve the productivity of those farms, uh, we could potentially have an impact um, on the uh, legal activity that was happening. Yes, thank you, Richard. And just to add, so um, from Tusk's perspective, our local partner organization working on the ground in Uganda um, is the Uganda Conservation Foundation, and we've been working with them uh, for many years. And they, in turn, partner with and support, support the Uganda Wildlife Authority um, and have for a long time been deeply involved and embedded in the rehabilitation and recovery of uh, Uganda's national parks and particularly Murchison Falls National Parks. So this Living with Wildlife project was a very big uh, part in the sort of the wider puzzle of the recovery of the Murchison Falls National Park and we were very pleased to be invited to partner with Ripple Effect um, and you know to form this exciting partnership between a, a development organization and conservation organizations. Um. Skipping the project and going on to the, uh, the results and key successes. Um, unfortunately, it's a very common, uh, should be common trend of the projects that um, we talk about tonight. Um, the, there undoubtedly are some strong results, some key successes. Did it achieve everything it set out to achieve? No, it did not. Um, the, our next slide looks at some of the reasons for that. Um, but. Uh, the statistics, as ever, don't tell the full story. So um, what we certainly saw uh, is that the, the 3,650 farmers and their families who we worked with had improved food security at the end of the project. Um, they were less hungry. Uh, they had more meals per day. They had a more diverse diet. Um, so we saw movements in kind of all those key areas to the level we would have hoped, uh, no. Um, but we certainly saw movement in that. We thought that was, that was significant. Um, the other thread that I wanted to mention was about the, the income. Um, of course, no, a, a bar is set, uh, and that, for this case, uh, was uh, $1.90 a day. Um, again, we uh, made a significant, I think, improvement there in the number of households who were uh, above that kind of internationally recognized uh, poverty indicator, but perhaps I think more significantly there was a very significant change in the behaviour, um, in the kind of orientation of those farms in which we worked, um, far more towards the market, um, a breadth of um, income generating activities, uh, increased resilience, uh, reduced dependency. So. Um, and I think that statistic on income generating activities really demonstrates that, that um, farmers and their households were uh, diversifying uh, and therefore reducing the risk. Um, they recognized the need to, um, to spread that risk and therefore to um, uh, increase their resilience by having more opportunities to gain uh, income, even if, as we shall see here, it was affected by, by crises. Um, and then dovetailing with the work that uh, Ripple Effect was doing um, in partnership with uh, UCF, um, we were implementing our Tusk's own Pan-African Conservation Education or PACE um, conservation program, which reached um, over the target of 12,500, we reached 13,700 um, school children um, with work that continues to this day uh, to change attitudes and behaviours towards wildlife. Um, in conjunction with that, um, we also um, did an extensive outreach program with the communities and we organised trips. It's interesting to hear the experience of, of ZSL. We organised trips into the, uh, to, into the National Park for community members and schools. Um, and again, a similar sort of experience. Many of the people living alongside the park 
have otherwise only experienced wildlife in a conflict scenario. So it was a great um, opportunity to experience and see wildlife um, in, a, in a different, uh, different capacity and also to see and learn about the impact that um, illegal hunting was having. Um, we also provided um, vocational training for youth um, around uh, living around the park, um, so in, in very uh, industries related to um, the local economy, so construction, um, steel work um, and that sort of thing to provide alternative livelihoods to those which might rely on natural resources. Um, <clears throat> here is just a selection of the challenges um, that the project faced. I, I think perhaps uh, a unique set of challenges in the, their complexity and uh, overlap. Um, COVID, of course, that everyone is familiar with. Um, in this context, that meant the closure of markets, um, which meant it's very, very difficult for our smallholder farmers to um, to be able to sell their sell their produce. This was a very significant uh, issue for us. Um, that central picture is drought. Uh, Uganda and the uh, project area was very severely affected by drought through two of the three project years, um, and that of course affected uh, the whole area, not just not just Uganda by any means. Um, and then the third picture is pests and diseases. Um, Again, that's something that we are familiar with. We are an agricultural charity. We're familiar with dealing with those, but um, there was a uh, coming together of several particularly nasty ones, virulent strains, um, uh, that again needed um, a particular management. So, um, um, and then in addition to that, the bottom left image there shows a, um, a, a, a pile of confiscated snares that were recovered from within the park over a 12-month period. That's 12 tonnes of confiscated snares and traps from within the park over this period. Um, we used... Um, the recovery of snares and traps within the park as one of our key indicators um, to try and uh, use it as a proxy for um, overall sort of wildlife crime as something that we could measure. Uh, but one of the consequences of COVID and the collapse in the local economy around Murchison Falls National Park was that actually as a result of that, hunting and trapping within the uh, park actually spiked considerably. Um, so um, addressing that was, 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 was a big issue. Um, one of the challenges right from the start was um, illegal fishing um, that the project has set out to, um, to tackle along with other measures um, in that region. Um, and then bottom right, um, before we had the drought, um, and as is, seems to be the pattern across Africa, it's either drought or it's um, extensive heavy flooding, we had the flooding of the River Nile, um, which impacted connectivity throughout the park. Um, and um, also saw for the first time hippos coming into farmland and so we had human hippo conflict as a new um, scenario that hadn't previously been recorded. Uh, yeah, so just very quickly on the adaptations. Um, we introduced a variety of uh, cassava, which is the staple crop called uh, Norocas 1, uh, which matures far more quickly. That was uh, um, hugely impactful uh, in reducing hunger, preventing a real crisis. Um, and we were able to, I said this, uh, the park is on the banks of the Nile, uh, solar-powered irrigation, although fairly expensive, fairly limited in scope, where we were able to, uh, to utilise it was hugely impactful. Um, quickly on poultry vaccination, uh, the, there was, um, the flocks were affected very badly by endemic disease and would crash year after year. By introducing um, a poultry vaccination scheme, we were able to halt that crash and actually expand the, the population of the poultry, uh, which clearly was a, an important asset for farmers. Um, and meanwhile, obviously through COVID, the schools were closed, um, but uh, we were able to sort of pivot um, and take pace and some of the outreach into the communities instead. Um, it's our last slide, I, I, I promise. <laughs> um, so uh, just again quickly on the lessons learned. Um, the importance of resilience, I think. Uh, we, we saw against a control group that the farmers from our project um, were demonstrated considerably more resilience in the face of these many severe overlapping charities than the wider community, um, just how important that is. Um, this is something that was absolutely a core part of the project from the very start, this commitment to adaptive management. Um, not to keep on doing things that aren't working, but to stop, reflect, work at why they're not working, um, 
have the courage to adapt um, and also improve, um, uh, to improve what you're doing to make it better and have a better impact for farmers. Um, and so just very briefly, I mean, I mentioned on the previous slide about the increase of the spike in, in um, trapping and snaring that happened in, in the park um, during uh, COVID, when that was one of the you know, targets that we were trying to reduce. The challenge there is that there are so many variables influencing that um, and extra challenges that we'll come on to um, in the, um, the, the, the panel discussion. Um, so um, the lesson learned is to, yeah, is to really sort of take the time to look at um, um, you know what we can use as, as uh, you know the correct sort of indicators and metrics for this project when there are so many things at work, so many variables to have to, to take into account. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. And yeah, we had a lot of conversations at ZSL. Um, with the Tusk and Ripple Effect team throughout the project and share a lot of the same experiences and challenges. Um, so, yeah, it's good to be able to talk about them tonight as well. Um, so, next up, we have Mai Tortahada Suez, who is Design and Impact Advisor at WWF UK, um, a veterinarian by profession, as well as a development expert and conservationist. Mai has been working in Africa for 14 years and now is based in the UK. And she works on supporting the design, monitoring, and impact of WWF's conservation projects and programs across the world with a particular focus on Africa. And the title of her talk is Land for Life, Strategies to Reduce Human-Wildlife Conflict. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, um, this, um, this presentation is slightly different in the sense that we haven't quite finished our project yet. So we are still in the last year of the project. Um, therefore, I didn't put the lessons learned. We are still trying to adapt on those lessons. But um, it's very much the same. You're going to see that um, a lot of what we are doing is very, very similar. So this is the area that we are working with. But um, it is a bigger area. So at the moment, where I saw you there is the southern Kenya and northern Tanzania from the, the ocean to the lake. We are not working in all of that. We are working in the gray area. But we are, we are interested in the whole of the, that sock knot area. Um, the reason for that is we are trying to apply a connectivity. We are trying to improve connectivity for, um, for wildlife. And like that, improving on the, the nature, improving on the land, and on the people that are living there. If you look at that map, the, the light areas are actually um, protected areas. So the area that we are working in is the area in between those protected areas, area where the people are living, area that is buffering the protected areas. So the animals are walking there between protected areas. We want to improve the connectivity, but the people are using agriculture. They are pastoralists. They, they got livelihoods there. So how can we have the two of them? How can we improve on that coexistence outside of protected areas? So the area that we are working in, the, the gray area, it's about uh, 9,000 square kilometers, and it's got about 160,000, 65,000 people, um, total population. So what it is that we are doing? Um, I'm not going to read all the objectives, and I'm possibly only going to be talking about um, the top two. Uh, we are something around governance and um, the natural resource management. As I was saying, what we are trying to do, we're trying to recover natural uh, resources by promoting wildlife connectivity and, in a way, improving on the uh, community's empowerment and reducing their poverty. So the, the communities to us are the main actors of this. They are no beneficiaries. They are the ones that need to be empowered to create this change. This change is them. It's not us. So what we are trying is to facilitate that this is happening. So what we are... The reason I'm not talking about the other two is because we are still halfway through, so there are aspects of advocacy, transboundary coordination, and aspects of livelihoods that while we are working on them, they may not be the more important at the moment, and we still don't have the results yet because we still got one year to go. But the areas that we really want to um, focus now is about that governance and the natural resource management. Why is that? So this area is basically pastoralist. 93% of the men in the area are pastoralists. So the amount of heads of cattle is unbelievable. 
And if everybody, almost everybody, is a pastoralist, what we are trying really to focus is what are the natural resources that we want to take care about, and in this case would be the rangelands. What is the, the grasslands, where the animals are grazing, because it's not only livestock that is grazing there, it's also wildlife. Wildlife is grazing there, how can we improve on those rangelands to avoid, um, to avoid conflict, to avoid uh, you know, problems with water, and then all the animals, wildlife or domestic animals, go to the same points and create conflict. So by creating, improving on the natural resources, trying to avoid that conflict. So that is somehow what we are trying to do uh, by improving that connectivity. So some of the problems that we are encountering in those areas, um, as you can see here, on the rangelands you got, you got erosion, you got um, um, invasive species, you got degradation. We got them all, and that creates that resources competition for water, for the, for the rangelands, and it creates human wildlife conflict. So just some case studies of what we've been doing. Um, in some of these areas, you go on the left-hand side, that is an area with some invasive species. We got many different types of invasive species. This one is a very thorny one, and even it reaches a point that not even elephants are crossing through. So you can imagine landscapes full of these, and it limits the access for people to where they can go, people and animals, or where they cannot. So on the right-hand side, you're right, yes, on the right-hand side, it looks a bit worse, but um, in that area, they've already been slashing. They've been removing all the, all the uh, invasives. And you can see, they've been piling them in different, uh, different piles. And what they are doing is allowing for the, the animals to cross, and they are creating, under those piles, it will be like a, um, like a seed bank. So the grass will grow there, animals won't be eating it, and then it will act as a seed bank for the, other, the rest of the area. So when the rains come, all of this will be covered by grass. It's actually working, it doesn't look like it, but it is working, so we've seen, um, we've seen some of this happening. Also because um, while the farmers are not using these areas, they are limiting which areas the animals are going, so they are keeping some areas as no-go zones so as to rotate where they are going and allowing for grass. Um, wildlife is moving everywhere. So this way you protect your seed bank, and, um, and then, like in the summer months, when the cattle is coming, there will be grass there. Um, some of this is similar um, on these areas. Is the, the whole committees deciding on which areas they were going to, um, to improve, and we are talking improving on, on gullies, improving on uh, invasive species. These are photographs from both Kenya and Tanzania and for different types of invasive species. So what is happening with this? We get these invasive species around water points, so the animals cannot reach, the people cannot reach, around schools. Um, we've been removing invasive species around access of communities, just for security, so children can actually move without an adult there, because you can see the animals coming. It's opening those corridors and allowing the wildlife and domestic animals to go through, and people to go through. Um, I said that those weren't the only type of invasive species. If you look at the pictures there on the, on the, at the bottom, there they are not only slashing the invasives, they are also trying to bend the roots. Otherwise, they come back even faster. So it is very labor intensive, and it's an almost impossible task that then needs to be maintained. So the one thing that we then need to do, these are also other areas that we got. Um, we were talking about governance. So on governance, we got, um, what we are trying to get is people participation, taking decisions, um, everybody, and by that I mean everybody, being informed and consulted, so men and women, all the adults in the communities. I was saying before that we had 165,000 people. So what we wanted to target is all the adults need to be consulted. Um, we need to reach a critical mass for this to work. I cannot be working with a thousand people because it wouldn't make any difference. So it's not a very sexy project in that sense. It's, it needs a critical mass of people to make a change. And for that, we need to ensure that they are all part of it or they, they are involved and their voice is heard. So uh, on those maps, those are two particular areas in, uh, in Tanzania. And what they've done is different communities got together and created grazing committees and they are working together. They are all, if the leaders are saying, these areas 
um, have to be, uh, nobody enters these areas until the summer months. Actually, nobody enters those areas until the summer months. So they are rotating their, their livestock and avoiding some areas and preserving others. And like that, um, it, it seems like little, but for different communities to get together and create those committees is actually quite a big thing. Because normally everybody works with their own people and that's about it. So just creating that, that general meeting and getting four or five different communities together for those committees and that governance, that is really um, is one of the best um, achievements that we've got in reality. Um, also on governance, we've been getting um, uh, other um, ACBO in the, in the Tanzania side. Um, we got some um, ranches, uh, land runs that is turning into communal land in the Kenya side. So these are um, kind of political aspects, but on all of that, they are um, allocating some land that is going to be managed for natural resources, for conservancies, for animals. So people can still enter and for their livestock, but they are keeping also um, space for animals and allowing that connectivity that we want to, to ensure. Um, human wildlife conflict. So I was talking about the maintaining the rangelands, maintaining the grasslands, allowing for the animals to graze, and that allows is the, is the actual space that we are trying to do. But how do we then avoid the human wildlife conflict in that space? One of the, the reasons was um, removing the limitations. So pe the animals could move freely and they are not um, conflicting in the same spots. But it's not enough, as we all know. So one of the things that we've been doing, we've been doing living uh, walls of BOMAS. Uh, you can see on the right-hand side, this is, um, is just a, a kraal or a, a BOMA or an enclosure for animals. But what it is, is like with uh, live trees. So these poles, it is local species that you plant it, and then they, um, they reroot. So basically, you'll get new ecosystems there. It will be stronger, um, stronger um, uh, livestock uh, corrals. Um, and what you need, then need to do is put in the, um, uh, the wire to hold it for strength. Um, like that, I think that we got like 240. I think there is another. Um, there's another uh, slide for that. Um, other things is like getting um, scouts or rangers that are checking for illegal uh, activities. All of them are community people. This is communities for communities. So on the governance, the leaders decide or they, they actually test who can or who cannot be a, a ranger. And similar to this, we didn't have any women at the start of the project. And now I think that we got nine women in total. I know it's not a big number, so we got like 165 rangers and it's only nine women, but, but it's increasing. The fact that they are now accepting it. These are Maasai communities. This was like a big win. The moment that the first woman reached there, it took a while, but once she was there and she demonstrated that she could compete with the men and she could do the same job, now it's the, the main rangers that say, yes, yes, women should be there. We want them there as partners. They are working together. And that is actually really nice to see. Um, we also have um, in the both sides, actually, ILARO talks or human wildlife conflict officers. And these are people that was demanded, not demanded, but requested by the communities. And what they were saying is that they needed people to help them. So they are a pre-warning system. These are people that are going grazing or helping people to recover their uh, animals at night when they are coming back. And they are also looking for signs, looking for signs of animals, and then indicating there are lions there, take your gun, livestock elsewhere. All of this is just small examples of what is happening there, but all of them have been requested by the communities. So part of this governance is for them to say, what do you need and how can we assist on providing that? Hopefully there's a bit more ownership and more sustainability this way. And that's why it goes, it's not as sexy, and it goes very slow, but it's going. It's actually going and it's actually getting results. Um, so some of these are some of the results. Uh, as you can see on this, on the, on the Tanzania side, um, we had, it's just because on the Kenya side they didn't have the same, um, the same dashboard, but it's just the number of animals that I helped, helped to recover. 
So we are talking about thousands and thousands of animals that at the end of the day, they get lost or diverted, and then they are helping to gather those animals. And the loss that otherwise would be on their families if that wasn't the case. I mean, you are talking there about thousands, thousands of animals. Um, this one is what I was saying before. This is like, uh, this is a lion paw print. Um, and some of those are in Tanzania, some of those are in Kenya, but they are doing similar jobs. They are checking for the signs of these animals. They are indicating to the, to the livestock keepers, don't go there or go there. How can you work? And that way we are avoiding conflict. But this is work with the communities. All of these are community people. Um, on the lower side is because they are, they are all entering uh, smart data. So whenever they see any signs, they indicate where those signs are. Um, they are all born there. So, so all of these people, the other things that they are doing, they are also diffusing any situations of retaliation. They are helping to recover cattle. If there are any problems, they call um, on other people. On the one before, I forgot to say, um, there is also people that are doing um, animal health workers. So the lady in the middle next to the blind man. So the blind man is actually one of the champions that we got. He's promoting, um, he's promoting for people to plant trees, he's promoting to, to improve on natural resources, and his wife is one of the animal health workers. So whenever there is any case of conflict, they go there, they, they only get paid the transport, they don't really get paid, but they are part of the community, um, community organization. I'm hoping that at some point we can get them to, to get some misstipend or something for their, for their treatments beyond whatever they spend. But at least it maintains that level. And they are giving a community service, and they were actually very happy to do so. Um, these are some other of the, of the um, dashboards that we got. So this is the conflict that we got on both sides of the border. And you can see on the lower uh, graph, um, initially there was a lot more um, on pasture. We've been constructing more of these enclosures for animals. And now that uh, conflict in pasture has been decreasing. So by collecting this information on both sides, they, there has been constant adaptive management. Where do we need to go and where those hot spots are? Um, this one is just the number of uh, living walls, the ones that I was uh, defining, so 244. And it's already, it means it's already been planted in 27,000 trees. These are just the poles, the trees, and within a few months, they start recruiting and they will grow and it will create different ecosystems. So, yeah. Um, this is now some of the results. We got loads of data, actually. Um, we are on the third year. We got one more year to go. And the one that I'm showing there is around conflict and tolerance. So what you want to see, the top one is 2022, and the lower one is 2024. The green line is increasing, and the red one is decreasing. So it's more the perception of people. How is the conflict? How is the tolerance? And we are talking here thousands of people. So all of this area is where that conflict and that tolerance is, is coming or not. Having these maps is also helping us to adapt and say, well, where are all those areas where the tolerance is still high, sorry, is still very low? If they are concentrated in specific areas, why is that? Why is that compared to other areas? Maybe there are, there are more cases of conflict, so we can, we can act on that. And I think that's almost there. So at the beginning, I was saying that the whole area is about uh, 9,000 square kilometers. Already, we got under governance, improved governance um, systems, about 2,000 square kilometers. So it's about 22% yeah, of the whole area. Um, we had the, the governance, as I said, uh, one CBO, a number of, um, of organizations in the Kenya and the Tanzania side that are already formalized. We got the grazing committees on both sides and best um, husbandry practices. I think that we already had more than 60% of the people indicating some of the improved husbandry practices. And that in total makes uh, 122,000 people. I'm counting people, I mean adults and their families. That is the total, so divide by five and then you get the number of households. But still, we are looking at the scale. We are trying to get a critical mass of people to make a difference on these areas. These are the people, the organizations that have been working. It's not only us, it's been WWF together with our offices in Kenya and Tanzania. 
Soralo is, the, is a land owners association in the South Kenya and the African people and wildlife in Tanzania, and obviously with the help of UK aid. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm particularly jealous of your um, very nice looking dashboards that you have. <laughs> Um, so last up today, we have ZSL's uh, Lena Jeha, who is Monitoring, Evaluation and Learning Specialist in the Conservation and Policy Department. Um, and she is an interdisciplinary mixed methods conservationist, passionate about generating and utilizing evidence to enhance our field programs. And she leads and supports data collection and assimilation efforts from ZSL's in situ conservation efforts worldwide. With over 15 years of experience, Lena's expertise lies in impact evaluation science, where she uses various study designs to determine what works, where, and why to inform adaptive management strategies on the ground. And Lena is particularly interested in community-led conservation initiatives, specializing in assessing multidimensional well-being and governance dynamics to ensure effective and inclusive conservation. And she'll be speaking about what next for society and conservation, key learnings emerging from across the sector. Okay, hello everyone. Um, so it's been great to hear from all of our talks today and learn so much. Some stuff um, definitely um, I'm gonna be talking about um, today. Um, so basically, um, in the conservation sector, while this project, UCAM project, has been one of the best tracked projects I've worked across um, in the conservation sector, the fact that we're doing this event, the fact that we're here all talking and learning um, is great, but sadly, we're not that great at doing impact evaluation or learning or monitoring in our sector. We're actually the, the least, we're sort of the lowest in terms of all the development sector. So we really have a long way to go in terms of what we call forming adaptive management. So really going from sort of documenting and understanding what our projects are doing, and then we've got pure practitioners. What we really want to be doing, which um, some of our talks have touched upon, is kind of documenting our evidence and understanding what works where and why. So in the talk today, I'm going to um, just talk through what a lot of the academia, I'm going to blast through what some of the latest evidence and research are showing in terms of what we can do for um, conservation and development of projects and also build in some of the impact evaluations I've done. I'm going to start off by talking about how we design our projects because this is really, really key. So in conservation, what we typically tend to do um, it's a bit of an academic exercise. So we've got people sitting down in a room um, and usually, although we have strategic goals and ideas about places where we want to work, sadly, we are still very dependent on what funding is available and what type of projects donors want to fund. They have specific geographies they want to work in, specific projects that they want. So we tend to do a bit of an academic exercise in terms of mapping out so we have a problem, so we might do something called a situation analysis, and then we'll design some activities, and then we theorize about how we want to get to our impact. So a lot of these projects have mentioned well-being, they've mentioned poverty, but what does that mean? What is poverty? What is well-being? These are actually academic exercises, and you can see in the theory, they're theorized in lots of different ways. So we typically if, go through this sort of exercise where we map out the different interventions, so we might say, we want to run an ecotourism project. Okay, that's going to improve the income. Then if we improve their income, that's going to create positive attitudes towards conservation, then we're going to improve their well-being, and hopefully change their attitudes, and then they you know, might stop hunting or whatever. But it's a very academic exercise. And what we typically tend to do is make assumptions and what I really want you to take away from my talk today is that society is heterogeneous. What works in one place doesn't necessarily work in another place. And communities are not all the same. Women, men, young, even amongst women, they're different. So we cannot use broad-brushed sort of ideas when we're designing our projects. 
So basically, that would be a really key takeaway that I'd like to say today. And also, it's not just about what we design, it's also about the way we implement them that is really, really key, and that we don't talk about enough. How are we engaging with communities? Do we have social scientists sort of understanding and conceptualizing, particularly in conservation? You know, how are we delivering our projects? Also very, very important. So I'm just gonna take you through some really key assumptions that we use in the design of most of our projects. The first one, is conserving wildlife and ecosystems will improve well-being. We know that billions of people around the world are completely dependent on natural resources for their livelihoods and the ecosystem services that they provide. So if we're protecting it, we are actually helping these people because they're dependent on it. This is one common assumption that we use. Another one is that by reducing poverty, we're going to help conservation. So if, if people are not as poor, then it's going to, you know, we're going to improve their well-being, then they're not going to need, you know, um, in one of the talks we saw today in the pandemic, people didn't have any choices, so they were going into the park and they were hunting more. So these are two very similar and key assumptions that we make. But what does the literature tell us? Actually, it shows us that improving well-being can positively impact attitudes towards conservation, but it doesn't actually lead to behavior change. Okay, behavior change is very complex, and there are lots of different things other than just monetary incentives that change behavior. So when we're designing these projects, we say, oh, we're gonna improve their income, then we're gonna change their attitudes, then we're gonna stop their behavior. There isn't a lot of evidence that proves that. Okay, so, um, what there is evidence for is that livelihoods, when we diversify their livelihoods, I don't like to use the word alternative, so when we try to do sort of um, interventions that work towards diversifying livelihoods, actually these people are really poor. So what it does is it improves their well-being, but it doesn't stop them from doing the other behaviour. So it acts as supplementary, not as an alternative. And actually what we have seen um, I remember talking to a chief scientist at UNEP WCMC and we were talking about evaluations and he's like, Lena, I've just been handed in this massive report of a project that we're working on in Indonesia. We've been working with coffee farmers near protected areas and actually all the work we've been doing, because their, life, their income improved, they had more money and they actually encouraged further deforestation because they wanted more land to have more coffee and grow. So even though this coffee was certified coffee and had been sort of like, you know, considered a very good, it was actually making the situation worse, not better. So just be careful what I'm trying to say is some of the narratives that we use to design our projects don't always hold true. The next one that we use a lot in conservation is that compensation neutralizes conservation costs. And what we're saying here is we're sort of saying, okay, there's human-wildlife conflict, I know, we'll give them a compensation, and that will give them positive attitudes towards conservation. And, you know, so examples range from ecosystem services, so Red Plus programs, nature-based solutions where we're paying for conservation. Um, it can be um, benefit-sharing schemes from parks, and it can be um, things like compensation for human-wildlife conflict. But what does this show? Often, the compensation that we're providing is nowhere near the cost that they're facing. Also, we're sort of saying money can take away from some of the other cultural and other types of losses that they face. So, for example, if they've had a very bad conflict with an elephant or species, someone's died, we're sort of saying, oh, here's some money. Does that really cover the cost of what they're bearing? Okay, so, so I really like this. This is taken from Woodhouse et al. She's like one of my favorite, a lot of my work, human well-being, is, is sort of based around her work and a lot of people from the development school at the UEA. I have put references at the end, so if you're designing a conservation project and you'd like to think through some of the key things, and those are meta-analysis that provide a lot of really key 
insights. But basically, it says, in summary, the evidence rejects the idea that compensation as implemented is enough to substitute for experience costs that often encompass non-material aspects of well-being, cultural losses, and also injustices. Um, it was good to hear from WWF that they were really talking to people and trying to empower them. That's a very big narrative that comes out of the literature and from the impact evaluations that I've done, that actually it's not about the monetary benefits that people can get, it's about what we call distributional justice, uh, um, sorry, recognition justice and procedural justice, which is about giving somebody a voice. Okay, some people in the name of conservation have been displaced. When we form natural protected areas, people have been displaced. Um, and we are restricting their access sometimes to natural resources. And money doesn't quite compensate that. We need to start thinking about other things. And that's why, which you'll see in the recommendation, justice is a very key aspect of projects. So when we're thinking about society and what's next, Justice is actually really key, perhaps even more so, and the evidence in the research shows this, than the monetary benefits that they can gain. So um, the last one, because we've only got 10 minutes, there's a lot, I'll try to sort of breeze through all this. Improving participation improves conservation effectiveness. So, you know, by talking to people, we're always looking for numbers, how many people did we talk to? This is gonna prove conservation. And now this is a narrative that is particularly um, sensitive to me because I've seen conservation in practice in, in quite a lot of different ways. And you'll have a meeting, for example, and there'll be 10 women and three men, but the three men will be dominating the conversation. Okay, so even though we're saying we're participation, what type of participation are we doing? Are we actually meaningfully empowering people to have decisions over the resources that they use? Or is it what we call tokenistic? So this was a really good example um, from Taita Hills in Kenya. It said 33% of respondents identified superficial participation as the greatest constraint on forest conservation. Okay, so the way in which we implement our projects, and, and I, I just saw it now, I shouldn't say this, we're designing and implementing a new project. Where are you gonna work? Oh, this one's the closest to the road. These ones are the easiest to access. Where are we even selecting where we work? Are we actually thinking through the people that need it the most? Or are we doing what's easiest, what's cheapest? Um, are we thinking about barriers to women participation? It's not just about getting them involved. They might not have the time. They might not have the, you know, the social costs might be big to them. I've actually seen <coughs> conservation interventions where we've done so much consultation that it has impacted the communities negatively because it's taking up too much of their time, okay? So we have to think about these things. And also, sadly, a lot of the evidence shows, even though we're working in marginalized communities, it tends to be the elite of those communities that are benefiting the most. So how are we gonna prevent elite capture? How are we gonna ensure that finances and the way that we work is actually engaging those that, you know, don't, you know, can't speak the language, that uh, can't read and write, how do we, that don't own land, so if, if we're implementing a project, like a Red Press project or a carbon project, that needs land, if they don't have any land, they're immediately excluded. So how are we, so how are we thinking through and working through some of these assumptions that we use um, in our projects? So I did an impact evaluation in, um, this is, we won't talk about quasi-experimental matching, but I use controls, um, and I looked at multidimensional well-being. These are some of the results. I just wanted to point out that you can see different, so we've got different dimensions of well-being and deforestation, that the other thing is that there's normally trade-offs. So we might improve well-being, but certain aspects of well-being, but we might make other things worse. So the other thing is, there's often trade-offs, and rarely do we see what we call win-wins in conservation. And so, uh, yeah, trade-offs, here we go. So I wanted to show you here, this is a human well-being index that's plotted against forest loss. And we can actually see the households that have higher well-being, so at the top there, um, have got much higher deforestation. That's because they've deforested and they've made the money from that. So this narrative, 
you know, that poor people don't... It, this is why they're doing it, so they can improve their well-being. Anyways, this is a funny little thing. What if it fails? We don't often talk about failures. So think about local needs in what you're designing. Try to prevent harm, which I loved about WWF, what you just mentioned now. You're trying to stop the human-wildlife conflict. So instead of thinking about compensation, you're, stri you're, you're trying to prevent the harm. So prevent the access, you know, restricted access or whatever. Um, ensure representation and restorative justice. Think about the histories that these people have been through. Have they been relocated? Have they been blocked? Have they faced... Um, fortress conservation. So think through these things, do a full cost-benefit analysis, support local institutions, ensure quality participation, um, think about human hate behavior, so really think through, are we actually getting to that behavioral change? And yeah, address the broader drivers, which we've spoken about here. We need to think about climate change, pandemics, you know, we can't just think small in our theory when we're designing our projects through these steps. We have to think about the broader picture because that's going to affect the results that we're trying to get to. So, these are some key papers. <laughs> and that's the end. <laughs> Food for thought. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you so much, Lena. Um, so we're going to move on to a panel discussion now. So if I can invite all the speakers back up to the stage. So we'll have some questions first and then we can go on to the um, questions from the audience as well. Um, so I think quite a running theme across those presentations is the complexity and difficulties um, you know, in measuring things like unsustainable or illegal natural resource use. There's so many different drivers. Um, measuring it is complex. Behavior change is really complex. Um, so coming to the two projects, um, so what techniques have you used, um, not just in this project, but maybe in other projects as well, to measure that change in unsustainable natural resource use? Um, and how reliable have you found those methods to be so far? Um, so should we go to Dan and Richard first? Um, yes, thanks, Liv. Well, I think this um, gives me the opportunity to just to, uh, to, to pick up on some of what I was saying in the presentation about the fact that our project um, had as an overall aim um, driving down sort of wildlife crime or hunting and trapping within the, within the park. Um, but there are great challenges within that, challenges in, in measuring that. Um, and um, even during, through the duration of the project, not only, as I said in the presentation, not only did we have a spike in hunting and trapping in the park brought on by COVID and the collapse of the, uh, the local economy around the park, um, but Uganda Wildlife Authority also changed um, its, um, its monitoring system. They embedded, for those of you who may have heard of it, um, a new system called Earth Ranger, which is a fantastic new park management software, but that was brought in slap bang in the middle of this project and meant that the, the, um, the way that data was being collected and recorded recorded was transformed during the uh, duration of the project and had to be embedded and so on. So um, it meant that some of the data was, was um, A, unreliable, in answer to your question, um, and B, um, also, was you know, there, were, there were other variables, as I sent it, said in the presentation, there were other variables um, impacting that, um, that indicator through the duration of the, of the project with, um, with, with you know, a spike in, in, in hunting and trapping. Um, so, the, so the lesson learned, and as I sort of briefly touched on at the end of our presentation, um, is, you know, we have to look very carefully at what indicators we use for this project, because actually, while we did see um, the, the, the hunting and trapping increase within the park, if it hadn't been for this project providing um, a real important piece in the, in the puzzle of the overall uh, addressing of problems at Merchant Falls National Park, it could have been even worse. And we would still regard the project as a very big, overwhelming success because of the changes in relations and attitudes and behaviours towards wildlife and the park and improved relations between the community um, and the, the, the park authorities. Okay. Richard, do you have anything to add? Or? Well, I think that's a very comprehensive <laughs> answer, but um, perhaps just one thing on a very practical level. I think I know um, 
Uh, agroforestry was a very particular issue for us, and I think we were very keen to monitor and try to improve uh, how, uh, how farmers were actually accessing fuel in particular, the use of, of, of trees for fuel. I think that was a, we, we, we didn't have very sophisticated metrics to, to, to measure it, but certainly we looked to reduce the pressure on those natural resources, um, partly by providing seedlings and encouraging kind of the cultivation of, um, of other, other fuel sources, more, more efficient ones. Um, I think that's probably the best thing I can add to that, uh, but thank you for the, the opportunity. Uh, Mai, would you like to? Um, for us, if I look at the monitoring plan that we've got, uh, one of the main um, tools that we are using, we are using household surveys. So we're asking people about their practices, we're asking people about their tolerance, their attitudes. Um, but that is social metrics. It can, today there was drought and, and you know what, everything went down. And tomorrow is a, is a good weather and everything goes up. So we are um, cross-validating that and triangulating that with, with other tools. We are um, also, you saw some of the dashboards that we've got for the actual cases of conflict that are coming up in the areas, cases of retaliation. Um, so we do have a lot of data to cross-validate what we are collecting, but our main tool in that sense would be um, people survey. So it is social perceptions that we are getting. And then if you want to see how good is they are implementing practices, then we do go and check, and we got some plots to check that the quality of these areas are improving or not. So there are many other tools to cross-check, but yeah, the main thing is it's a self-reported um, tool. Um, thank you so much. Um, and Lena, going to you as a MEL specialist, um, do you have any recommendations or suggestions for people who um, would be looking to measure these sorts of behaviour changes in their projects? Behaviour change. Well, uh, <laughs> that's quite hard. I, 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 I think behaviour change is probably one of the most challenging and sometimes I feel, at least as biodiversity sector, sometimes we need to flip it and try and look at the quality of the resources themselves as well, which we sometimes don't do, um, because that's going to indicate whether the pressure has been taken off the resources as well, which is our ultimate goal or, or, or achieving conservation. Um, because um, behaviour, people are also very smart. This is one thing I've seen. People tell you what you want to hear. So it's a very big challenge to really try and understand what's actually happening. And I think triangulation of data is actually the key um, because, you know, people will tell you what you want to hear. So I think it's more, rather than saying this is a specific tool, it's to have the bio monitoring of that, e e the natural resource or the ecosystem, and then creating different data sets and triangulating, because it's very hard to monitor effectively. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I will just have one more question here before we go to the audience. Um, so what do you think was the most innovative idea that the partner communities or stakeholders put forward during your project? Who'd like to go first? Okay, I'll go first. <laughs> um, I actually don't know. It depends what do we mean by innovation. Innovation for me or innovation for them? A lot of the ideas that we've been applying is ideas that local communities have been applying for many years. I was telling you about the, the, the slashing of the invasives and how they are uh, recovering uh, seed banks. They also had um, how they were recovering on gullies. So they got animals getting on gullies, on the erosion, and you lose the animals. They, they die of starvation because they cannot get out. And local communities were getting those in bases. They blocked the gullies, and then whenever the, the rains come, they get covered by, by soil, and therefore you fill the gullies. It was completely new to us. Innovation for us, not for them. So it depends what you mean by that, because for them, those were, we were assisting on implementing local solutions, which to me had more effect. Innovations from us, possibly using more um, science, that we were getting them to use science, like how good was the pasture, the quality of the pasture in some of the areas, or maybe don't move your livestock yet into those areas, wait, or, or check in the quality on those areas. So for them then using that evidence for decision making would be an innovation for me, common sense. So, I've got a problem with the question. <laughs> um, if I may also slightly uh, interpret the question uh, to suit my purpose, um, <laughs> I think that um, um, 
for me, I think, again, as I mentioned in the presentation, I think it was around perhaps some of the enterprise activities. And it was just how innovative, entrepreneurial some of the farmers we worked with were, um, how quickly they saw interesting new markets, interesting new possibilities, interesting new products that we hadn't thought of. In that sense, we were prescriptive. Um, the, the project supported cassava, vegetables and poultry, um, but we just sort of started it off. And once it, once it began and gathered pace, it went in all kinds of interesting directions and formed cooperatives and connections internationally and in other ways that we hadn't anticipated. So um, uh, I hope that has interpreted your question in a, in a useful and productive way, but thank you. Definitely. Dan, anything to... Uh, yeah, I mean, I would just add to that. I mean, it doesn't sound innovative, but I would pick up again on something I, I mentioned about the impact that um, organising school trips and community trips into the park had on on, on those the communities. It's so simple, and it's great to, to, to hear it being done in the ZSL project as well, and we've seen it um, done on a number of our uh, project partners across Africa. Um, and it, I'm surprised it isn't done more often that these communities living on the, the, the outskirts of these protected areas don't get the opportunity to go in and experience the wildlife as, as tourists may, may do so. Um, but what was also organised on these trips was, was an extra sort of behind the scenes aspect where they got to meet the rangers, spend time with the rangers. And so to hear the rangers' perspective, um, you know, to, see, to hear it from, from their side, um, as, as well as what, you know, the challenges that the communities are, are experiencing. And they got to see, the communities got to see the sort of the confiscated stockpiles of these traps and snares. And when you see that sight of the volume of, of, of trapping that's happening in the park, um, that had quite a profound impact on um, some of the community members who sort of, you know, they vowed that um, whether or not it's, uh, they, 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 they're true to their word is yet to be seen, but they vowed that they wouldn't, you know, that they would go into their community and, and try and prevent that, that poaching. And I think if that's then coupled with the sort of the livelihood support um, and you coming at it from all, all angles, then that can have a, a meaningful impact. Thank you. Yeah, and just to highlight on the ZSL project, I think of all the different outreach activities that we implemented, certainly the bus tours into Savo National Park was sort of the most, had the most profound and positive impact um, on people. You know, anecdotally, people, they were so positively received. Um, and it also allowed us to reach um, everyone in the community, so people with a disability as well. Um, as well as their uh, caretakers. So yeah, it was really, really great. Um, and yeah, again, really great to share that experience as well. Um, we've just got 10 minutes left. So um, I think we'll go to some audience q and I can already see a hand coming up. I'm gonna give my mic over here. Yeah, thanks to all the panel members for an enthralling set of talks, very, very interesting. But one of the great problems I see with all this is first of all, the establishment of uh, sort of like solar powered energy sort of like supply in the, in these areas and also irrigation not just irrigation to the farms but also maybe even to the the, the the wildlife parks themselves to stop elephants for example destroying too many boabab trees you know in their desperate search for water during drought periods but another question is about where the conflict is coming from is conflicts between farmers and elephants what imaginative ways have you come up with any to sort of stop this, to mitigate these conflicts between elephants and farmers by maybe surrounding the farms with plants that elephants don't like, maybe with lots of beehives, because I've heard that elephants don't like sort of browsing, on, grazing on plants where there's lots of bees nearby. So just if you could say about the attempts to improve the energy and irrigation infrastructure, which would cope with drought and also prevent people from cutting down trees you know, using burning wood as a source of energy, and also about mitigating conflict between farmers and elephants in particular. Sure, um, yes, I can talk to, to that. Um, I wish we'd been able to do more of the, uh, the irrigation. So um, the small solar powered pumps that we had, that we inst were, were part of the project, um, I think it was about 20% about or so of the farmers actually had access to those areas. There, was, there were also issues, of course, with negotiating those um, 
prime riverside plot, which were, were easiest to, to irrigate. Um, one thing I didn't, didn't talk about, which was actually uh, another important part of the project, was um, developing savings, uh, the savings culture on a, on a, on a village level on, on, on around the kind of group structure that is such an important part of how the, the project works. Um, so saving for um, something like a solar powered pump um, would be a very, uh, a very kind of worthwhile project for lots of, lots of those groups who didn't have themselves have access to it. It's, they are expensive, but they are sort of just about attainable in a, in a cooperative sense. Um, so I think that that could be certainly a technology that eases some of that burden, um, reduces some of the pressure on rain-fed agriculture, which was part of the problem the project was set up to address. Um, yes, there are limitations to any technology, uh, cost being one of them. Um, other things being equal, we could have done more, but yes, cost was prohibitive. Um, but certainly there's potential to expand that. Um, but I mean, but Africa is blessed with, with one thing it does have in abundance is is, um, is the sun, you know, it, except for maybe the rainy season. Where, where, where it was introduced, it worked yeah, remarkably well. Um, so, so uh, and it, it had that seasonal, um, it took away some of the seasonal dependencies, certainly. Um, and the volume of, of fruit and vegetables that were produced was extraordinarily high. Yeah, so undoubtedly it has very significant potential. Who'd like to ask about human? Um, I can certainly talk briefly about, I mean, human, ele human trying to uh, prevent human elephant conflict um, is a massive to topic in itself. Um, uh, so I'll, I'll just touch on it lightly. Um, I mean, there is no silver bullet to managing human elephant conflict. It is very context um, dependent and there's a whole toolbox that one can try um, to, 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 yeah. to... I would say especially in the wildlife corridor areas where yeah. you have farms where you're going to see yeah. more conflicts. Yes, no, that's right. And you mentioned beehive fences and I know that in certain uh, parts of Africa especially they have proven very successful and they have been trialled around Murchison Falls, particularly in high agricultural areas that are prone to, uh, to, to visitation by elephants. Um, in, in my experience, one of the most successful um, techniques for preventing human-elephant conflict is electric fencing, but it has to be maintained, and, and that therein lies the challenge. And, and you know, getting with a, the, with a solar power generator. Well, think. it can be, but it's not just the solar. It's not just the electricity supply. It's actually that you know, ensuring that the fence line is well maintained. And you know, I mean, elephants are smart as well. If they'll, you know, they'll test the fence. I've I've heard reports of you know, older elephants pushing younger elephants into the fence <laughs> to see if it's on. Um, and you know, so so it has to be it has to be well maintained. You've got. To, and you've got to look at sort of you know ways and ways and means of ensuring that the community have ownership of that. Um, also, but also around Murchison, it's it's um, you know it's simply driving elephants back with whatever means it may be loud noise, firecrackers, that sort of thing, and that comes down to often the rangers. Um, and and if the rangers are seen to be responding to the human elephant conflict, then that in itself you know if they if the rangers are seen to be on the side of the communities and helping drive the elephants back, then that in turn helps those dynamics and those relations between the park and the community. I'll take one more question. Hi, I really enjoyed listening to all of you this evening. Um, my question is, um, a lot of uh, conservation uh, is, is focused around habitat quality, but habitat needs land to what extent do your projects help in establishing the 30 by 30 uh, uh, target? Um, okay. If I can answer to that. So we didn't have a 30 by 30 target in this um, program, but what I was saying now, uh, in my mind, yes, I do. Um, for the monitoring plan, no, we don't. So what we want to do is that um, whenever we were talking about governance and the communities are, are setting aside, even if they are subdividing their land or they are using communal land, they are setting aside certain areas that is used for, um, is used for livestock, is used for wildlife, and it, they are maintaining the habitat. So what I was saying before, um, they are 
keeping animals away from areas, so allowing wildlife to be there, maintaining it in natural conditions, and then they can use it in the summer or not, so they are rotating. Part of this governance is for them to set, okay, this is all our land, how much of this land is used to maintain these corridors, how much of this land is used for the grazing, how much of this land is used for agriculture. And on that, I already was saying, so far we got 2,000 out of the 9,000, so it's about 22, 22%. We don't reach the 30 by 30, the 30%. That should be uh, the target. But to me, that is the target. Possibly there is more than that 30%, but that is the one that's allocated. Outside of the one allocated, there is a lot of land that it is, if we were to measure it, is still considered within that 30% that we want to maintain in natural um, conditions. But this is land that is actually, in our case at least, allocated to maintain pristine just for that, for that purpose. So yes, it is basically for the 30%. Um, yeah, I can talk briefly on that. I mean, in, in relation to the project that we've just um, presented on in Murchison Falls National Park in, in Uganda, then, you know, that's not part of any sort of um, plans to, um, to meet 30 by 30 targets by virtue of the fact that, you know, the human population around Murchison Falls National Park, particularly in the northwest where, area where this project was focused, it's very densely populated. So the sort of the idea of, of hoping to sort of, you know, um, rewild further areas or reclaim further land and extend that protected area um, isn't a target there. Um, but certainly that is the, the, the case um, elsewhere across Africa and with some of the projects that we do support. It's, you know, it's looking um, to take a, a sort of a landscape um, scale approach um, to, to work and, and to, to, to conservation. Working, working with communities on different sort of zoning patterns for, you know, different land use. Um, and we, you know, historically and, and even more so to, to this day, we invest as tasks quite heavily in um, the um, conservation, uh, the, the wildlife conservancy movement, so community conservancy movement. Um, and I think there's a, there's a big future of that in that. And we're seeing the community conservancies, um, you know, emerging more and more across Africa. In fact, there's a fledgling um, conservancy movement now in Uganda um, that we're looking to sort of encourage with um, the experience of those that we've supported um, across Kenya, uh, which, um, you know, which, which have, um, you know, the conservancy movement in Kenya now um, covers about a quarter of the land area in, in Kenya. It's quite impressive. Great, thank you. I think we are um, out of time for this evening. Um, so just another round of applause for all of our... So our science and conservation events are now finished for the summer, but we return again in September. So please keep an eye on our What's On page um, of our website for further updates on new and upcoming events. Um, and please also let us know how um, your thoughts about tonight in our feedback uh, form, and you can use the QR code on the screen um, or um, type in the Survey Monkey link there as well. Um, and thank you all again so much for coming, and I hope you have a great rest of your evening. Thank you. Thank you.